It has been brought to my attention that my clarification last week in the Telegraph that there is no basis in international law to mandate Red Cross visits to terrorists has prompted the ICRC to misstate international law, doubling down and entrenching its position favouring the interests of terror over law-abiding states. So here is a 101 of the provisions in international law which might prompt the ICRC to reread the Geneva Conventions. I include them in the link below this video. Let's be clear about the law that applies to Hamas members and other Palestinian terrorists held by Israel, even if this were to be considered an international armed conflict. They are not prisoners of war. They do not satisfy the definition of POWs under Article 4 of the Third Geneva Convention. They are not members of regular armed forces, nor are they part of militias who conduct their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. Therefore, Article 126 of that Third Geneva Convention, which provides, amongst other things, for Red Cross visits, doesn't apply. There is a reason why, when the Geneva Conventions were drafted, the status of prisoners of war was agreed to apply only to regular armed forces and members of militias who conduct their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war, and therefore not to those fighting as part of groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They are not legally entitled to the range of special rights and protections designed for professional soldiers. Mm. Denial of POW status is an essential legal sanction against their modus operandi of terrorism and war crimes, and providing the status of legal prisoners of war undermines the international legal order and rewards war crimes. No doubt, much to the lament of internationally prescribed terror organisations, they do not benefit from the protections of international law afforded to the soldiers of law-abiding armies. It may be that even the ICRC in fact recognises the POW status is inapplicable, wrong in law, because in its most recent response, it actually seeks to justify protected status of Palestinian terrorists on the basis of the Fourth Geneva Convention and the false allegation that Gaza is occupied. Let's just pause for a moment to let that sink in. The Red Cross is essentially seeking to represent that Palestinian terrorists have the same protected status as that which civilians should be afforded under the framework of occupation. Even if one wished to argue on the pre-2005 status of Gaza, and there are other uk videos that address the status of the territory. Since 2005, when Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip, there is no rational argument that it has been in control of the Strip or in occupation. And Hamas's effective control, its ability to build a terror army, abusing civilians and taking over civilian infrastructure for its terror bases over 16 years shows how ridiculous the claim is that anyone but Hamas has been in control of Gaza since its violent takeover of the Strip in 2007. And even since the start of this war, after the attacks and the atrocities of the 7th of October, Israel's presence in Gaza has never amounted to effective control. There isn't currently a single area in the Gaza Strip which we can say the IDF has effective control over. There were previously 25 IDF brigades in Gaza, there are now four, and in each area in which they are located, intense fighting continues. Mm -hmm. Every place the IDF has left is immediately retaken by Hamas. Even the international media hasn't been able to ignore that in recent weeks regarding Al-Shifa Hospital. So there are no ICRC visits due, but of course the basic protections that people be treated with humanity apply. And the insinuation that the ICRC has made that this has not been the case does them no credit. In fact, under Israel's domestic law, the protections it applies to detainees are guaranteed. The ICRC buttress their misrepresentations of international law with an implied blood libel that Israel is mistreating detainees. The ICRC lost any appearance of neutrality 
when it refused to convey medication to Israeli hostages in Gaza, according to their families, and claimed not to be active there. In Israel, the ICRC is being sued by the families of the hostages for failing in its most basic mandate. Rather than doing its job, it has blamed the real victims, pointed the finger at Israel and echoed Hamas's demand for an unconditional ceasefire that would leave the terrorists in power. The ICRC enjoys a special status in international law. What an indictment that it refuses to use mandatory language regarding visits to Israeli hostages, and that there are now questions about the potentially sinister reality behind calls for ICRC access in Israel, whether that provides support for terror. The NGO, Palestinian Media Watch, has reported on ICRC visits, facilitating the payment of salaries for terrorists under the Palestinian Authority's pay-for-slay policy. The stipends paid by the Palestinian Authority, according to the severity of the crime, to terrorists charged with committing terror attacks against Israelis, rely on ICRC documentation, which, on the instructions of detainees at interview, stipulate how the money should be paid. The ICRC's denial of complicity does not sit so comfortably with the comments of Palestinian Commissioner for Prisoner Affairs, Kadura Faraz, who is responsible for the pay-for-slay payments. He describes the ICRC as essential in the process that enables payment to imprisoned Palestinians and laments that the current lack of access by the ICRC to detainees is hampering the payment process. Here is Kadura Faraz in January on official Palestinian Authority television, courtesy of Palestinian Media Watch. Is it the case that the supposed independent, neutral organisation looking to provide humanitarian assistance to victims of armed conflict has enabled the Palestinian Authority's support of the perpetrators and the terrorists? I would advocate a wholesale inquiry into its activities given these dark revelations. It has implications for whether Israel must consider the visits prejudicial to the security of the state. I wish... ICRC officials would read the conventions they consider themselves to be guardians of and certainly refrain from misrepresenting their contact content on uh, social media to the unsuspecting public. The conflation and the fudging of IHL does a disservice to those that rely on the ICRC. It is the opposite of the ICRC's intended purpose. Law works on the basis of a framework or rules being applied to the facts or circumstances. It is not wishful thinking or based on the feeling of the ICRC. They consider themselves to be the guardians of the law? Fine, they should stick to the law. The approach of the ICRC also does a disservice to all those involved in the meticulous drafting process of the Geneva Conventions, and the careful consideration given by all those states' parties who signed up to them, especially in the context of IHL, which is law that governs the most chaotic of circumstances, the confusion, the fudging, and the dissemination of legal fiction by the ICRC puts more lives at risk. The Red Cross has reported complicity in support for terror, its abandonment of neutrality, its apparent refusal to assist the victims of the 7th of October, and its misstatements of international law on the very basis of IHL are a threat to international order. <laughs>